Okay, hi everybody. Hopefully you can hear me, even if you can't see me. So, uh, yeah, so a slightly different take um, with uh, what is now Parker Megit as of about a month ago. Um, so obviously when we started on this journey, um, it was Megit, there was 40 odd sites, um, of which now um, uh, with this particular presentation, we've concentrated on 17 sites. So um, hopefully most of you will be aware of, of Parker and of Megit. Um, I haven't got any um, slides about the business on here, um, but obviously you've all got Google. So just uh, what we're going to look at is the, um, the, cover, the sites that we cover uh, for AS13100, the timeline, similar to what you've already seen today, the milestones, where we are around um, site performance and compliance and where those gaps are. Um, and risks, talk about training, and then a quick summary, and the next steps. Okay, so as I said, we have 17 sites. Um, you can see all of the quality leaders on there. Um, forgive me for um, showing you the, uh, the 10 actually member sites again. That's probably about the fourth slide today you've seen that. Um, so yeah, um, we are pretty well spread out, as you can see, again, before we uh, became part of the, Mark, of the Parker family. Um, still trying to get used to that, of course, with Parker Megit. Um, so I am based in Anstey Park, um, that you can see there, um, and we've got our group operations there. So we do have a group business management system, um, and uh, what we've done for a number of years now is develop that. So we did have a little bit of a head start as regards commonality and standardization, um, and we have worked as a team um, in those areas. So just a quick look at the timeline. Um, we, we really kicked off um, late 2021, um, started off, um, as you can see here, going through a number of steps. We are, you see the line there, um, pretty much the end of September. Um, we did move that slightly. We was a little bit behind, probably by about a month actually. Um, and as you can see there, we should really now have all of the gap closures from all of the sites. So we do have regular reviews. Um, we also have one or two reviews with customers. Um, we, we have a quarter review. We just had one last week with GE, with Barbara and her team. Um, and, that's, and that's been good as well. That's um, been, been good feedback there. So we are, um, you know, no surprise. Um, so a little bit behind, as you can see, we've got a couple of sites. Um, and what this, this particular chart is showing is where we haven't actually received the gap closure back from the site. So it doesn't mean that they, they're not still working on that. Um, we just, as of today, we haven't got it. This has been quite dynamic. Um, you know, I think we updated this slide just yesterday. So as you can see, um, where we, across all of the sites, um, where we feel um, we should be at the moment, you'll probably see that a little bit more on the next slide, actually. So as a, as a cumulative performance, uh, we're at about 61%, and we should be at, 66%. Um, so um, obviously that'll be bumped up if we get the next two sites across the line, which hopefully we'll, we'll receive um, very shortly. So um, we, as I say, from, from a group level, um, there has been a number of gaps. So we work with the sites um, to actually uh, update a number of procedures, you know, around management review, audit, human factors, again, has been another one um, that we've also had to... Um, recently update um, our internal group procedure and cascade that across the sites. And, and also the training material has gone through quite a number of updates as well. So where are we as regards compliance by site? You can see, see on there. Um, in, in fact, I think we've got Freeborg in the, in the room. I haven't met Chris if he's here today. I did see somebody from Paris was here. Um, so if he is, that obviously, um, be a good person to speak to around their experience. Um, and as I say, the, the two at the end there is just because we haven't had the, um, the actual um, gap assessment submitted to us um, to date. Okay, so as regards the, uh, the web there, you can see um, we're not in, not in too bad a shape. There's one or two areas you'll see, you'll see more uh, of those areas on the next slide. But again, um, we do have a group quality manual um, and we've actually very recently published that, um, in fact, just before the Parker Megit um, acquisition, our CEO 
um, did actually sign that off. Um, and that's included obviously updates to the policy requirements in line with 13,100. And, um, you know, there's some challenges around MSA. Um, that's what, one of the gaps that we've found, um, both training and application and implementation across some of the, um, some of the sites. And again, around audit and management review. But you'll see that a little bit more uh, just here on the next slide. Okay, so most of these are actually very close to being completed now. And I don't think, when we looked at the questions earlier on Slido um, and some of the people that I've been talking to and some of the other presentations, we can see that, you know, some, there's some um, obviously repetitive stuff um, around, you know, certainly human factors is one subject, isn't it, that's come out quite a lot. Um, so we've um, updated all of our training around human factors and we've actually got a procedure. Um, and that, is that procedure released? I think it is released now, isn't it? Yeah, that we see there, MQA 33. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about the foundation training, the three-day course. Um, and, and as I say, you know, we're not, we're not too far away now from closing quite a few of the gaps as regards GBMS. Um, and we will then um, kind of, you know, look down on the Pareto to see what it is, um, what the next challenges are that need to be addressed. Okay, so on the training then, so all of our, our quality leaders have gone through the, um, the actual executive overview and the, um, well, they say 10 hours, don't they? I think the training, but it seems to be, <laughs> seems to be a bit longer than that. But yeah, the, uh, the 10 hour course. Um, and the, so the level three um, foundations course, I took that, I think did this, about the second cohort in February, I think, um, this year. But we do already have um, quite extensive training at, um, you know, with the, at the site. We've been developing it for another year, a number of years around APQP and PPAP and FOD, counterfeit, human factors, um, auditing. So we do have quite comprehensive training of our own. We have had discussions with the, um, the ASQ about that. So we are looking to deliver the, uh, an equivalent three-day training course ourselves. We will be looking to deliver that as a pilot um, in the UK next month. Um, and that's the, um, the kind of the agreement that we've got with the AESQ um, at the moment. So we do also have a learning academy um, at Megit, um, now Parker Megit, and um, we've put 800 engineering professionals through various training this year already. Um, you know, I think we've got some, like 40 modules included within the three day training. Um, and, and where we haven't, you know, where there are gaps, we do look at support from um, external providers as well. So a summary then, so we do have monthly site leadership um, reviews and group reviews with the sites. In fact, weekly reviews, I think as well, um, in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, GE has been a real driver with us as, as regards, you know, that, that cadence and updates um, with, with the customer. We also um, got quite a bit of um, dialogue with Rolls-Royce as well. We, um, we see them quite regularly um, and we are, um, you know, reporting and updating the tracker. In fact, it's, I mean, it says monthly there, but it's been, you know, quite, quite more frequently than that as we're getting towards having all of the gap assessments um, coming in. Okay. So the next steps for us really are to continue working with the site. You know, uh, we've got a very close relationship. Um, we are looking at better ways of, of sharing best practice and lessons learned across all of the sites. We do that in the, in, in, in the, the, uh, the joint um, calls that we have with the sites. As I said, we are looking to um, deliver that three-day foundation course because, you know, it's not about quality leaders, is it? It's about, you know, all functions, you know, MEPE, Q, uh, QE, design engineering. So, and I think that's something that we've probably got a lot of quality professionals in here today, but, you know, we don't just want, um, the quality teams to, to go through this training. We want an awful lot of our um, engineers um, and different support functions to understand how important APQP and PPAP will be in the longer run, as you've seen, you know, from, from um, uh, Ricardo's um, um, presentation early, earlier, you know, it's about, it's about that journey. It's about putting in the time now so that you get the benefits later on. Um, and then the best way to do that, in my mind, is on new programs, you know, 
that's really where we're going to see a game changer in the longer run. So I think that's about it. And it looks like we've got lunch. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think if we can have JNL Machine and SKF and Megat come up. Um, sorry to put you in this position, but I think it'd be a great opportunity for questions. Um, those were some fantastic presentations, I think very real about some of the challenges that they're facing, um, as well as you know some of the ways they've conquered it. Well, very loud. Um, and, and I think that this would be a great opportunity if you have any questions, um, let's just talk through it, right? Because everyone's facing the same thing. Um, it definitely takes time and they started early. I think they're also very different size companies, which adds, I think, great value that it, there's a lot of different approaches to how to get from A to Z um, and everything's on the table in terms of how you get there. The key is just to start. So any questions from the audience? I think we have a couple microphones. Tracy has a microphone. Can run. Hi, uh, Pat Bellinger, Collins Aerospace. Really, for um, um, Steve, I mean Sean and uh, Brandon, you you really talked about the manufacturing side of it, and really great results, I think, or you know, planned results. But from a thirteen one hundred and a ninety one forty five perspective, it all should be starting up front in the design aspect of it. So did you, the question is, did you get, and I assume you do um, make the print, right? Right, you, you're not really involved in the design part of it. So did you get the design uh, aspects of, of the input for like, for instance, DFMEA stuff? Did you get that input to go into the PFMEA? Did you get the planning up front and design side from whoever your customer is? or is it really just focused on the manufacturing side? From a, a support from a customer standpoint, it, that's been very, uh, from a DFMA standpoint, it's been non-existent so far. Uh, that's still something that we're hoping that changes, um, but yeah, the, a lot of that is based off our own design experience with the product. So even though we maybe make to print, we'll still maybe necessarily involved in the design and um, come up with it and then give that to the customer that it's on the print, but for the most part, there's very little um, support from that standpoint. Um, Jenna, Jay and I has a little bit of a different story. Uh, Pratt Whitney actually loves to come in our facility and work with the design and see what's manufactured or not. And they also give us a, a summary of their DF, DFMEA to beyond what's beyond the KPCs, uh, what else is also important to them that we need to track. So I actually, I want to thank Pratt Winnie for doing that. That helps us. Okay, so. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Bill DeMarsic from Airbus. So I saw some things where there was a uh, a change from part family PFMEAs to part number PFMEAs. And I think you had realized the difference or made that transition. Have you noticed the benefit when you switched? Have you gotten there yet? Uh, that's still a work in progress. Um, a lot, a lot of it has to go back to the whole APQP process. When is it required, right? New design, design change, uh, process change. You know, we haven't really got to that level yet. Um, from a generation of them standpoint, it has provided some small value. It helps us think about things from a, if we grind this feature in this part versus this part, it may have different risk associated with it. It, okay. it again, it's, it's that, it helps just makes you think about that a little bit more uh, but the biggest impact from that is just the resources to complete that 
um, very much in the infancy of that, that journey. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, I mean, we're, we're in the same process. Um, yeah, we're, we're wait, actually I have to thank Carrie, uh, our quality technician. She does, she's been helping transition from part family to part specific. Um, I have noticed that we will find a couple extra dimensions that like, hey, okay, there's a little bit more risk in that one than you would say just getting from a part family thing. Yeah, yeah, just on that. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of product specific. I mean, they've got to be product specific, but let's be realistic. You know, that's great um, for a new program. Um, you know, we've got a lot of ZD programs across a number of customers. Um, and, and it then makes sense to maybe go process and family because we're talking about an awful lot of part numbers. We're coming from, you know, a long way. Um, so um, that's probably makes sense in that case. But, you know, we are very much about, you know, they must be product specific to really gain the value, you know. So um, that's the, the approach that we take. Okay. Uh, good morning, Brett and Lutz from DuPont Vespel. Um, question is non-specific for who'd like to answer it, but I'm not sure if you've gotten to this phase yet in your deployment. But speaking about internal audit, I'm kind of curious about how uh, the new the new requirements are very prescriptive, and I'm kind of curious about how you've like what kind of changes you've had, you know, from before and after uh, to your internal audit program, both in practice and in training for your auditors. Mine's an easy answer. I'm working with my internal auditor in the next couple of weeks to see what we're going to do. So that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you see, yeah, so internal audit, I mean, obviously, we had a good discussion about this yesterday um, in the pre in the pre meeting. Um, so, so at Megit, we've got, you know, we do actually mandate that uh, anybody doing system audits go through the lead audits course. Okay. We then rely on, the, on, on those leaders, you know, to manage the, the different audits across the organization. Um, so the actual audit report, the annual audit report, I think is obviously one of the supplementary requirements that needs a little bit of work. Yeah, because um, I was in one of our sites a few months ago, actually, and one of their gaps was around, around the audit annual report and everything they had was there. And I think they tried to maybe try to overthink it. Um, I think it was as Larry, as somebody said earlier, you know, all the information from the audits is there, just trying to put that into a little bit of a report really, maybe a pre to on some of, some of this, the stuff that you're finding and feeding that into, into management review as well. Yeah. Question? Yeah, Brendan Chan for CPG. What's your experience there with the factors implementation? Uh, human factors. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, from, from, from that standpoint, I mean, historically speaking, I, mean, I think we've all probably had um, customer complaints that he had to look from a human factor standpoint. So unfortunately, probably I already went down that journey slightly. Um, but I mean, if, if you've had other regulatory oversights, uh, FAA or you know, any of the other regulatory board, you've probably had some other human factors, uh, obligations, requirements uh, over, the, over the years. So I mean, I mean, so I mean, you have the punitive from a customer complaint standpoint, but then rolling it into design has been um, very difficult rolling it into just a standard training package for, uh, from a manufacturing standpoint has been very easy. It's, it's been a, a factor that's already been in place. Um, a lot of our, our safety requirements have already had a lot of the human factors aspects in it. Um, the design's been the biggest challenge, but manufacturing has actually been the, the easiest aspect of that. I'll probably say, real quick, I'll probably say something on human factors. Um, we've been working, you know, at GE, even with Rolls-Royce and some of our mem other member companies of AESQ um, on doing a PFMEA on human factors. And there was a conference, a quality conference up at Boeing about a week or two ago, and that was highlighted as an opportunity. It's really cool. It's by, it's very standard, clear. Um, we can get everyone the information, but if you're looking at a, an area of the factory, a um, a section and and instead of building your human factors into your pfmea by part you're doing it by area and just going through you know 
the, the 12 you know, key factors, it, it really is easy to lay out kind of what potential issues might you have. Um, and I think for us, it was kind of a light bulb moment. So that could be an opportunity for everybody. Have something? And, and we are building it into the next release of, of the human factors uh, reference material. So you'll all have it. Uh, sorry, so we have been working last week on that and we have 14 uh, new appendices. One of them is the PFMEA and uh, I hope uh, we will uh, put it through ballot during this month or maybe it will be in November or something like that. It should be released. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, James McMillan from Kuhn and Argyle. How do you see this process extending beyond the warehouse dock door um, and into the final mile piece. I see sort of millions of dollars invested in process to improve billions of dollars worth of stock. But if it falls down at the final mile, you still have a quality issue. Um, how do you see this process extending beyond purely the manufacturing and dock door process and, and extending to the final mile to, to actual physical delivery to customer or to aircraft? Maybe you restate that. Okay. Um, so quality is in the core of everything we do as a business. We're AS9100 certified. But again, that's focused very much on warehouse process. So obviously, we, sometimes we're line site with you. Sometimes it's external site. But we'll take the parts that have been through this quality process that have, uh, have had all this, this investment into it. But eventually, it goes beyond the warehouse dock door and onto a transport network where it's delivered to to a manufacturer, to an airframe, to an AST at an aircraft somewhere in the world, if the same quality hasn't been applied to the final mile supply chain, all of the work that's been done upstream kind of falls flat. So is there, a, is there an initiative to take this beyond simply just the manufacturing process and encompassing the entire supply chain from point of manufacture to point of consumption? Because at the moment it feels like we're, although we're AS9100 from a, from a final mile perspective, wheels and diesel, it, it, we don't have the same structures or same quality processes, and, and how do we improve that? I, I see the I see the challenges you're talking about. I'm thinking myself, how am I going to get my my suppliers to buy into this, and what aspects do I want to flow down that'll be a, a, applicable to them? Um, I've actually done some of it for them in the past because some of my suppliers are like two, three people. So do I want them to do paperwork or cut chips? So sometimes I'll help them out with the paper paperwork aspect of that type of thing. So yeah, I, I see the challenge and I, I, I'm thinking myself how to how to do it with the sub tiers. Are you also referring to packaging, transportation? Is that really what? Yeah, absolutely. Packaging, transportation, uh, the whole piece. I'll give you a really good example. So we uh, hold AAG and MSC stock um, and an, an LRU stock for various airlines. Uh, there's a, an, an engine control unit that I saw in one of our stores recently that's been out and back to an airline about three or four times. Hmm. Um, it, it's been checked in, checked out, checked in, checked out. It's not been consumed. Um, the packaging needs replacing. Um, there's, there's not really a standard for that. It's, it's up to the individual companies to whether they're happy with that standard. But when, you, you kind of lose control of the product once it goes through the door. It, it's the same as you could, it could be worth a million dollars, but if you FedEx it, there's a good chance it's going to turn up broken. You have very little control over that process. So the final mile piece, transport, packaging, all of the piece, all, all of the parts of that jigsaw that dictate whether the part is serviceable or useful, having been through millions of pounds worth of development and production and quality improvement upstream making sure it's actually useful or usable or consumable when it arrives at the point of consumption. What can we do? And it might be a question that we take off topic and, and actually we speak to you guys directly about right. how do we, as final mile providers, buy into this? What, what can we do within this framework that we can put into the final mile? Yep. And I'll open that to the, yeah, yeah go ahead. I can, I can share what we do. Um, I actually have to thank John Frick and his team. They, 
we have our own trucks, we have our own drivers, and we're responsible for how we handle the material going to all our suppliers. And uh, we work back and forth on our design and packaging so that way they get to where they need to go in a safe location. And we find that popping up a lot in our FMEAs is you know, handling damage. So we, we uh, put a lot of emphasis on our uh, packaging and how it handled and we control it internally. We try to pick our suppliers local so they can be delivered and shipped back and forth between with our own with our own trucks. Yeah, I, I know packaging obviously is part of the APQP process. Um, and so that's something that can be attacked and handled there. And you know, we may need to take this offline in terms of something to think about because that is not something that we kind of endeavor in today with AESQ. It's a lot about delivering a quality product to our customer. And that comes from sub-tier to tier one, to OEM, to the airline. But then once it gets there, and then it kind of, if you moves back and forth many times, you know, that's kind of a special cause normally um, in our world. But it's, it's an interesting question. Thanks. Hi, I'm Simone Pickenworth with Valence Surface Technologies. We're usually third or fourth sub-tier. And so my question for you is, um, you know, you half of you said you've worked with the DFMEA with your uh, OEM and Brandon had not. How are you pushing that downward? I'm mean, assuming that you have some type of chemical processing um, that happens to your parts after it leaves your facility. So are you partnering with them to help them with the APQP? It's not something that we normally have to do. Um, to help them learn that and get on the same lines with you. How's that experience been? Uh, from our standpoint, it's been fairly uh, basic where our sub-tiers has been directing the ASQ website, answering direct questions they have, but not really giving any overall guidance from going on site to help guide them through that process. Um, most of that's been because that hasn't been requested, um, but I mean, to complete disclosure, there's been a mountain of... Uh, journey ourselves it's one of those where slow down the requirement right now and uh, we're worrying about climbing our own mountain first um, with flow part of that's you know obviously flowing down but we haven't gotten to the point of validation from a supplier standpoint yet Well, you could still do it later today, I guess, you know, if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, this is the last call. Okay. So we're going to give a token of our appreciation to these, um, you know, to our suppliers. I, I think you can give them a round of applause. Really, this puts them in a really interesting position, and they've done fantastic.